today we're going to be talking about six use cases, but there's a little bit more to it than that I think just talking directly strategy. Um, and, and the way that we're going to start things off is explaining kind of what the tools surrounding marketing of this nature really involve, what the pieces are that you need to start to even think about doing something like this, and then kind of the strategy around the strategy uh, is, is an odd way of saying it, but it is. It's, it's starting to think about where you want to focus your, your different tactics and use cases before you actually even start building them. So there's a little bit of buildup here, but once we've kind of laid the groundwork, <coughs> excuse me. We're going to start talking about some actual specific use cases. I can give you guys the verticals for the use cases that I'm describing. These were actually real use cases that I built out and that we saw results from, but um, we are under some limitations in terms of what I'm allowed to talk about. So without further ado, let's, let's head on in here. As Kenneth mentioned, my name is James Burnham. I've been um, with Telium as a company for about four years and then been in the marketing operations, digital strategy area or kind of function for about nine years now. Um, I kind of got into the business sideways. I was working in the finance department, ended up starting working with a, a CRM tool um, early on in my career, enjoyed it a lot and, and started learning other CRM tools. Before I knew it, I was in marketing operations. And then from there kind of evolved into more of a marketing strategy, digital strategy type role. And and it's really kind of taken off. And, and obviously the industry itself has great need for folks like us and and that really helped me solidify where I decided to go with, with my current career. So getting to the presentation here, um, what we're going to talk about involves the necessity for a, a customer data hub. There's a lot of different words for this. Um, CDP is kind of a prevailing term in the industry nowadays um, in terms of customer data platform and, and what you need to really start segmenting, creating personas, having a strong visitor stitching strategy or, or visitor identification. But all in all, you need some form of a customer data hub. Obviously, the use cases that we're talking about today are all Telium centric. We built these through Telium, um, but you need something that will allow you to do that visitor identification, that um, the segmentation, the persona, and, and obviously the activation, um, some way of, of getting it off to a, a vendor or, or using this current vendor, send emails, do paid display, personal on-site personalization, that sort of thing. After that, we're going to start to talk about what the strategy around the strategies I said before is the five stages of a customer life cycle. And we'll get into a little bit more seriously, but the way that I like to describe it is you want to start thinking about each of these areas that your customers are focusing in on, you know, the awareness portion, the consideration, the, the actual conversion, and how do you make them go from one step to the next? How do you push them along and, and make sure that all of your use cases kind of focus on optimizing that path for the customer, making that journey more pleasant, um, more directed, less confusing, less frustrating. And then finally, or not finally, sorry, third point here is six use cases. We're actually going to go through each of these use cases one by one. Uh, we'll probably only get through four in the timing today. Um, I believe that's as many as we have on the deck here, but if we can, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of more after that. Um, how to use the predictive insights to keep customers in mind. This is when we start to talk about machine learning, how that comes in towards the kind of pathway of your, your success for your customers. So where does the predictive insight portion come in? When should you start using ML? How can you start leveraging that? And where are the benefits, where are the, the pitfalls, what to watch out for, that sort of thing. So let's hop right in here. The, the tools that we're going to be using for most of these use cases um, or all of these use cases are going to involve at least the first two here and sometimes the third. Customer data is is kind of the obvious one here. You can't do anything without customer data. There's no way to make this work unless you know something about the clients and, and the folks that are visiting your website or, or engaging with your brand in some form. Um, as we collect information about them, obviously through first party means and, and with their consent, we start to understand who they are and build a profile. Once we have that profile, we can start to act on their behaviors to make things better for them. That's really the goal here. It's not to uh, make something that will force them to buy or, or trick them into doing anything like that. It's trying to improve the experience so that they purchase based off of their habits and, and their preferences. That's really it. Beyond that, we talked about a customer data platform, some way of retaining those profiles, housing all of that information, and, and being able to leverage it through third-party vendors and activate it through those things to actually get some sort of use out of it. And then finally, once we've kind of nailed all of these different parts of the customer journey, 
we can start to talk about how predictive insights fit in here. How does ML really work inside your business and, and where can we leverage that, that use? Very quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, and really this is any customer data hub or, or, or CDP in most cases, but I want to talk a little bit specifically about how Telium works. Um, this is kind of the data flow of how a visitor will engage with your CDP or your customer data hub, drop the information off, and then get leveraged later on. So when somebody is on your website or, or even in store, as long as you're collecting information, <clears throat> the way that this works is on the left side here, we have all of our different data sources. We have our online domains. We have our CRM data, if you're, you're passing information along from there. We have transactional e-commerce data, even fi uh, data from CSVs and, and offline files and that sort of thing. We're collecting all this data from these different data sources, and then we're bringing them into our system. This is where the, the CDP, technically also your tag management software and a few other ones come into play. But you're, you're bringing those data sources into your CDP, and you're starting to relate them together and, and identify a person as they come back over multiple sessions and different devices and that sort of thing. Once you're able to identify them and kind of mesh all those different profiles together, you have a singular profile that will house a lot of behavioral data for that person. Once we know a bit about that and the kinds of people that we really want to target, you start to do something called segmentation. You're, you're separating them out into different groups based off of what their preferences and, and behaviors are. This allows you to create your VIP customers, your suppression groups who maybe have already purchased something, um, your on the fencers that you want to send down a different marketing path. It gives you a lot of freedom of movement from within your digital marketing space. From there, once we have those groups, we send them off to the third parties. This is where it goes over to your email service providers, your display vendors, your social vendors, your on-site personalization vendors, anything that you, your SMS, everything else, anything that you want to use as a channel for marketing at this point is where you send this off. And I think one of the biggest callouts here is that through Telium and, and the CDP through audience stream, we create all those segments in one place inside the customer data hub here. And then we send them off to your vendors. So you're not sending off the raw data, the, the behavioral data to these vendors, and then creating each of the segments in each of those ones multiple times. You're creating an inside Telium and then orchestrating that data to go out to the right place. You create the audience once, and then it, it goes out, and maybe one audience goes into display vendor and su suppression for email or something like that, and the other one does the opposite. So you have that, that kind of orchestral tool right in the middle, and then send it off to activation. With all that in mind, before we can finally get into use cases, I want to talk a little bit about the customer lifecycle. The lifecycle itself is built out, and this is very general, obviously, but we tried to make it somewhat one size fits all. It's built out in about five steps. The awareness portion of it at the very beginning <clears throat> is really before they even know about your brand. So what we're talking about um, is somebody who is thinking about purchasing or not even thinking about purchasing sorry thinking about uh that they have a need they have a goal and and your brand potentially can solve that for them so you're trying to get some sort of information about your ad ad workings in front of them in some way i think you can see my dog in the background it's kind of funny but uh what we're doing here is is a lot of times this is lookalikes targeting similar audience targeting where you're taking a group of people that you know um and then you're showing them showing ads to folks that are similar to them based off of Google or Facebook's algorithms. This is top of funnel marketing. It's bringing in fresh faces to the website and getting them to engage with the brand. Um, and then consideration, which in this case is allowing somebody to go on your brand and actually think about converting. So we're not at the point where we're trying to push them on the conversion, but the consideration portion is, is really when they're already engaged with your brand, how do you get them to start considering purchasing? And yes, you're going to, you're going to start thinking in this direction as well. It's each of these are kind of built for a specific use case, right? Um, I even mentioned one for number one already, but the consideration portion is really pushing them over the edge in that direction. And then acceptance is they're on the fence. How do we get them to actually take the plunge um, in terms of a conversion? And then retention itself is allowing somebody to, <clears throat> after they have purchased, come back and start to think about converting again, start to think about uh, the next product that they would be offering. Um, and then advocacy and re-engagement is them talking to other people, them re-engaging with the product, them 
<laughs> excuse me for one second here. There we go. Um, and then from there, really starting to think about advocacy and re-engagement and everything else. And then taking them back into the consideration portion. That's really kind of the, the big, the, the keynote there is going from this consideration, acceptance, retention model, and then pushing them back in with advocacy and re-engagement, getting them to reconsider what you have to offer and how it can help them. And all of our use cases are going to focus around taking them from step one to step two, step two to step three, step three to step four, and, and so on. So without any further ado, let's hop into here some use cases. The very first one that we have today is creating VIP seed audiences for lookalikes and similar audiences. So we mentioned this. This is the top of funnel marketing. This is the very first one in that customer lifecycle. Um, we're talking about trying to figure out ways of bringing people from the, I would say, from the, the state of having nothing to do with your business into the idea of, of them understanding and, and starting to look at what you have to offer. So a VIP audience is a you know very important person on where we take the customers that you would consider the most valuable to your business. Um, and, and the conditions here is really what the key of the use case is. This particular one, we ended up using for a finance company. And the finance company was looking for very specific people who had opened accounts, who had a certain amount of savings in their account. And so on. there was a couple other conditions. One of them was um, demographic related and so other. But it really kind of fits depending on what kind of customer you would find ideal, what kind of customer comes back and converts over and over again, you put into this particular audience. That allows you to create a group that you can send off to Google and Facebook, given that you have enough information about them. And Google and Facebook will look at that group, use its algorithm, and find other people who fit similar descriptions to those folks. So it's, it's kind of an idea of making sure that you're able to segment that, that ICP, the ideal customer profile, and then push it along. And the power here is your conditioning, your data, and what you're able to do to find that specific group. And for this particular client, we ended up making it, um, it's not a very short process. While it seems like it's boom, boom, you create the conditions, you move along and you, you pass those along. There is some tweaking that takes a certain amount of time to really get right. You need to be able to, first off, create a, a, a coherent conditioning setup, but then also pivot as time goes on. So you can optimize after time and, and really focus in on, is this working? what pieces aren't working, changing those pieces and moving on. Outcomes here is, is top of funnel empowerment, really an expansion. It's bringing new faces into, into your brand and, and getting them to start finding out what you do and what your offerings are and, and beyond that. Um, the ideal customer analysis here is, is beneficial as well. Not only creating the top of funnel, but starting to look at, do we really know who our ICP is, our ideal customer profile is? And as you tweak and change those conditions to, to use for this use cases, you might get a new understanding of who that grouping is. And then unique customer data growth. Even if you don't get revenue out of it, if you're getting fresh faces to come to the website, it's a big win. So moving on here to use case number two, we're talking about highly engaged user conversion. Oops, sorry, let's click there. And this was actually sports vertical. Um, this team had a, uh, a wealth of folks who were coming to the website, looking at the game schedule, looking at the, the mobile app, and then probably going to watch the game and, and kind of dropping off in terms of engagement. What we wanted to do was get some of these folks to actually convert into season tickets or, or single game tickets for that particular season. Um, there was some stuff we did with off-season merchandising and, and that kind of stuff, but this was during the main season. Um, they were trying to increase ticket sales, and we wanted to find a group of people who are engaged and would consider it. And so we looked at all these different cohorts of people who were going into the roster and looking at other teams after looking at our team and then trying to match up the games they were into. But really what happened was some of the most engaged users who returned to the website over and over again and had bought tickets in the past were folks who were just looking at the game schedule briefly, coming back later in the day, looking at it again, um, or, or using the mobile app to do the same. So we, we added a little bit of on-site personalization. With a lot of these sports vertical teams, we don't get a lot of information about the people visiting the website. So we're not getting email. We're not really getting Google IDs half the time. It's, it's a little bit tricky. So what we ended up doing was focusing on on-site personalization. That's where you take um, 
the information that you have about their behavior and use that to just affect their current visit without knowing anything else about them. So we take that profile data. <clears throat> In this case, we know that they were looking at the game schedule. Sometimes we know what game they're looking at. Um, a lot of times we do because they would click on it to see the time and, and, and scroll down from there. So what we would do is while they were on that page, we would bring up a little banner like, hey, here's a discount for the game that's coming up tomorrow or the next day. Um, would you like to go see it in person? Single ticket discount. And we had an enormous amount of response from that. We had an extremely high single game ticket conversion from the folks who bought those single tickets. We were able to create another use case where we were able to actually push those folks into season tickets and got a great response from that. Overall, this increased single and season ticket revenue by over 20% each over the course of, of the next, I believe it was two and a half months or three and a half months that were left. Um, and it was a really interesting use case to, to really play out. Number three here is the cruise searches and affinities timed interval targeting. It's a mouthful of a, a use case, but obviously this was a cruise line vertical that we were working with, and they were trying to figure out ways to really get new, get the returning customers to come back. Their demographic was of kind of the elderly community, um, usually in the 50s to 70s, not elderly, but in the, the 50s to 75-ish range. Um, and then beyond that, they did have a very specific group of, of 75 plus um, that they were targeting for, for a lot of these different use cases. But the ones that we ended up focusing on to try and get some of these folks to come back was noticing the cohorts of what their behavioral actions were. What were the things that they seemed to do um, every year that led to a cruise or, or what was the surrounding data around them signing up for another cruise and then maybe pushing some of the folks who didn't end up expressing that behavior to to see if we can get the, those folks to come back and it, it was almost like predictive insights light it was like we were trying to do ml's job without having ml at the time so i like this use case to kind of transition into our machine learnings uh use case there but but the, the way that this one worked is we noticed that people were coming back every year and purchasing a cruise um, with a similar location and a similar date. Um, and a lot of times this was something like a birthday or a work trip that a company took their, their folks on. Um, and so when we started to identify that this was happening with a certain amount of frequency, we started to build out use cases where we would identify what their particular date and location was each year. And then we didn't see them come in and look for it and, and purchase a cruise. We would remind them. We would send an email. We would send actually a direct letter in a lot of cases for this one. Um, but we would we would kind of bring up their favorite time and date, and then push them, in, not push them, but but give them the option to like, hey, in case you forgot, it is that time of year again. Why don't we get you set up with a cruise um, to your favorite spot that you've always gone to? And then, additionally, we started to notice that uh, uh, just a straight timing of date. Every 365 days from the last time they would start to uh, get a cruise, a lot of folks would just have this time, even if it wasn't their birthday, if it wasn't the same location and date, um, or same location rather, it was just an X amount of days ago. And it wasn't always a year. Some folks, um, especially those with that were retired and, and <clears throat> had a, a surplus of sons in this case, would just go every three months, every 90 days, they'd be looking at another cruise. Every 180 days, they'd be looking at a cruise. And some of these folks would be benefited from from just having a timer that would say, okay, every 180 days, let's send them a direct letter with all of our offerings. And we got lots of responses from, from several different areas here. And this is, this is one of the use cases that really helps you understand how valuable enough data is. Because there's never data that is technically useless, especially in the behavioral data area. Because eventually we're going to find some sort of use of either making their journey better or finding better ways that our product can align with what their interests are. And the data here is really what saved the day. Us doing cohort analyses and, and figuring out really where the focus of of the customer's mind was when, when picking a new cruise was, was what allowed us to create these use cases that made it even better for them. So really cool stuff. Beyond that, I did want to talk a little bit about the kind of customer roadmap. Um, <clears throat> working at Telium, we sell CDPs and, and tag management softwares and, and predictive insight tools and data retention tools. 
And whenever somebody purchases our platform, we kind of start to go through the, the general implementation phase of them getting set up within the, the platform and, and pushing things along as well. And everything that we've talked about so far has kind of taken us from adoption to growth to optimization. We're talking about, you know, fixing top of funnel, pushing conversions, and even re-engaging with that retention and advocacy portions of it. And we're, we're kind of moving them along from adoption to growth to optimization. But once we've kind of peaked there, once we have use cases for awareness, for consideration, acceptance, and all those things, uh, I get asked very, very often, where do I go from here? We've, we've nailed these first few bits, but there has to be a next step. Where does the expansion take us, as you can see here on the map? And really, from there, what we're talking about is machine learning. Machine learning is taking the data that you have that you've used already, the behavioral data that you've been employing to create these use cases that have gotten you through steps one through five, um, and, and bringing it up to the next level. It's really saying, like, okay, now that we know what they're doing, how can we think about what they might do in the future? How can we start having these predictive insights and, and start making decisions, not reactionary, but predictive, but, but prescriptive and, and, and kind of getting ahead of the curve rather than always just waiting for them to do something and then deciding what the next thing they should do is. So in this particular use case was with a technology company and what we ended up doing. So here was the, the need that they had. They had a group of developers that were customers of theirs. And then they had a group of business folks that were also customers of theirs. Um, the developers were a smaller group, and they really wanted the developers to get cordoned off to a different area of the site because they wanted them to work in that space. It was a newly developed space um, that allowed them to create solutions and share them with other business folks and, and maybe even sell them in the, in the marketplace that they had provided. But it really, they wanted folks to learn about this new area of the website. And they were having trouble identifying who's a developer from who's business because there's a lot of crossover. So they didn't know who exactly to market this new area of the site to, and they needed a way of quickly identifying everybody in, in their customer data pool. You can send out an email and hopefully people respond, but you're going to get something like 8% response rate if you're really, really lucky, especially with the size of a customer base that this particular client had. But beyond that, what they decided to do was use the data they currently had. Um, and try and create some predictive insights around that to predict who was a developer without getting them to answer it directly. What they noticed was there was a particular part of the website that had been um, available for a long time that was specifically for developers, and it had to do with a form that they filled out to get a certain certification and then an email and, and kind of down a different customer path there. But it was only developers that were filling out this form. Um, and really what they wanted to do was take the form and say, OK, if I know that only developers are filling out this form, why don't we use predictive insights to check who is likely to fill out the, this form amongst my database and use that grouping as our developers and push them, push them down the, uh, the solutions workspace that we had created. And it turns out great. We, the way that our, our predictive insights work is we take a group of folks who have done the thing you're trying to predict, in this case, filled out the form, and figure out the attributes that led to them doing that particular thing you're predicting, and then apply that to the rest of your database and give them a coefficient of zero to one decimal number. That's how likely they are to do that thing. In this case, it was kind of a coefficient of how likely they are to be a developer ended up being very effective for them and allowing them to quickly analyze who amongst their database would be best for cordoning off to this area and uh, allowed us to, to essentially quickly achieve what their goal was and they were very very happy awesome those are the use cases we're going to get to i know we only have a few minutes left here but i did want to leave some time for q a real quickly uh Tilium does provide this joy of data cookbook which has a lot of these use cases and many many more which are really interesting to check out um, i believe the link will be somewhere available on this site as well um, as well as follow-up but i really appreciate your time here kind of listening to me rambling on these use cases and everything else. So um, I think we have some time for questions here. Kenneth, if you're able to pop back on, um, not sure if there are any in the chat yet. So yeah, hold on one sec. By the way, just a reminder to everybody, send questions through uh, over on the left-hand side, you'll see a question mark box. So, 
got a couple that I want to go over first. Uh, here's one. You mentioned having a data first approach being crucial. And so is a customer data hub. They don't have either. How do they get started in that direction? It's a good question. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> data first is, is the way to go in this day and age. We need to have something to connect with customers on. And really, that's going to be about them. In terms of getting started, um, there's a lot of different ways. Telium, obviously, I have to plug my company, here, but uh, we provide the ability for you not only to collect the data, but to standardize it, allow it to speak the same data as all your other data, sorry, speak the same language as all your other data, enrich it through our audience stream and, and orchestrate it to be activated downstream with your other vendors. So Telium is a great option here, but there is a, I will say a fattening of the market lately of, of what are CDPs are and, and how to get involved with them. It's really about understanding where your data is coming from and what the best system is to kind of pass it through and activate it along in a third party sense. So I'd reach out to anybody that has a, a CDP that you know in terms of business, or you can reach out to Telium. We have a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's the understatement of the year is, yeah. <laughs> uh, or the last probably five years, uh, explosion of CDPs. Uh, so here's a question from somebody in the audience that sent, it says, see if I can read this correctly. Um, how does somebody go about, let me, I'm going to paraphrase it again a little bit. How does somebody go about handling walled gardens with everything being partitioned with so many data sources that are disparate? <clears throat> Great question. Uh, and Telium, we call it data silos. Um, allowing your business to get kind of separated out by the data here. So I, I work with a lot of retail customers and, and one of the really big ones has a lot of on-site sales, online sales, especially since COVID, but we're predominantly a brick and mortar store for a very long time and trying to get the, the in-store data, which we had the ability to collect and, and collate and partition and bring over to combine with the online data, which is really where the strength is because we have people who are making purchases in store after doing a ton of research online. So without those two matching up, we really don't have the full picture because maybe we know mm -hmm. exactly what they want, but we had to see what they bought. So it's really about connecting that. So in the Telium sense, what we try and do is create one spot in the middle for creating the middleman that allow all of your data to come in and all of your data to go out in that spot. We are not necessarily the ones collecting it. That's gonna be your stores, your, your online website behavior, and everything else. We have people sending in data from CRMs. We have people sending in data from HTTP API from, from random sources. And then we don't activate it either. We send it off to your Googles and your Facebooks and your ESPs and everything else. But we have one spot in the middle. And that's where Telium's strength is, is the ability to really be the middleman to where everything comes in, everything goes out. So you really can't get affected by the silos as much. The wall gardens kind of lose their strength once everything is meeting in the middle in one spot. Because you're doing a lot of the work in terms of collection and standardizing and segmenting in one spot. So I'd say that's probably my answer on that one. Yeah. So I, here's another question from somebody in the audience. And this reminds me of something. So I worked in big data and worked a lot on closed loop measurement. So get where you were with the online offline uh, marriage. And then when I went to work for a brand, I, I was excited that uh, when I was on the brand side that it was uh, we were using Telium. So it helped uh, fill a lot of gaps for me. but where so the question that the the person asked in the audience was where do we kind of position this with uh, i'm kind of thinking of scott brinker uh the godfather of martech and where do we position this within our landscape because again when we look at a piece of technology like this it becomes confusing enough just you know trying to explain to somebody it's a cdp a dmp a dsp and everything else we're we're sort of the the sweet spot of explanation if you will so that people can explain that to their management team hey we got it we need telium absolutely and it's a great question and i think it, it really rolls in from the last one as well it, yeah it, the the i will say the thousand foot view answer is right smack dab in the middle it's mm -hmm. it's where your data is coming in and where it goes out that's where we, we sidle in and we, we rest right in between those two actions. We need to be the guys that collect all the data. That, that's our bread and butter, is getting it from every possible source that you have in mind. We need to collect that data because we will give you that 360-degree view of your customer. 
So if we're not getting all the data, we can't guarantee mm-hmm. that the profile of the, the person visiting your website, going into your stores, engaging with your brand is complete without all of the data. Once we have all the data and we've recognized the person who's kind of in the position of, of engaging with your brand, we create the profile, we, we have all that data listed out, we've segmented them into the groups that they fit in based off of the conditions that you create, and then we pass that data along to any activation channel that you want. So again, between collection, that's not necessarily us, activation, that's not necessarily us, but that in-between is really our sweet spot. That's where we go. Fair, fair. So here's one more question. Um, you said predictive insights can keep coming back for more. How do we get access to insights like that? Do you have to have a special piece of, of MarTech to do so? Yeah, so you'll need an ML engine of some kind. And everybody, every tech company under the sun currently has their version of what the right ML algorithm is. Um, I kind of explained mine a little bit, but <clears throat> basically using your customer data to predict what your customer is going to do next is our version of that ML space. Our platform is called uh, Telium Predict, as I mentioned before. Um, and it sits kind of on top of our audience stream, which is the CDP. And really, it uses the CDP to predict what your client is going to do next based off of what their behavior is. So if you have, if we're doing something very similar, <clears throat> like predicting their if they're going to purchase in the next 10 days, we'll look at other people who have purchased in the next 10 days. We'll look at what led to them purchasing. Did they come to the site three times? Did they get a badge saying that they were abandoning their cart? We look at everything mm-hmm. that happened to them before the purchase. And then right after that, we'll apply this model that we've created to everybody else who didn't purchase and see if they match, if they correlate on those leading attributes that led to a purchase and then give them a score. But yeah, you'll, you'll need some sort of machine learning product. Again, ours is Telium Predict, but there's a number of them out there right now. Fair, fair enough. So most important question that I got from somebody in the audience, and I'm making that part up, I'm making this as a question <laughs> just for me, is what kind of dog is it? <laughs> What's its name and what's in the closet that it was looking for so fervently? I knew that uh, everyone was going to wonder about that. So he's a Rottweiler. He's 140 pounds. His name is Apollo. He is a big old rescue that I got a few months ago. Still kind of learning the the house life. Um, But the funny part is he was not looking at anything in the closet. On the other side of my bed here, there's like this little part he can itch his back on. (laughs) <laughs> so he was just rubbing his back against the side yeah. of my bed. Well, so, you can't uh, have an, a 140, <laughs> 140 pound dog and not name him Apollo. That's that's a perfect name. So, uh, James, a great session. I really appreciate it. Uh, as I mentioned, I've used Telium before and and know it's it's a great value. So, uh, really appreciate the insight you shared with us today. And uh, have an amazing rest of your day. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. I, I think this event is wonderful and I'm excited to see the rest of it. Thanks, Kenneth. Perfect. Thanks, James.